UFC Sao Paulo predictions, picks, bets. Let's make some money this week. Another international fight card, not in the U.S. This time we're down in Brazil, which means that Tony Kelly, Colby Covington, they're not going to make a lot of money betting this week, but you and I will because we got the recipe. Let's talk. At the top of the card, our main event are the big boys. We have heavyweights J. Alton Almeida and Derek Lewis fighting this week. This was supposed to be Curtis Blades, which I was excited for because I do want to see J. Alton Almeida tested against somebody who can grapple, but in steps Derek Lewis. And if you're watching this channel, if you watch content like this, this is a very obvious spot. You can hammer J. Alton Almeida in this fight because the reality is in some of the biggest moments the black beast whom let me put this out there i love dearly if you ever in your life find yourself in a position where you can bet on Derek lewis where he's not fighting somebody ranked in say the top seven if the fight's not the main event if he's fighting somebody who wants to strike if they're not in houston texas that's a situation where you sell everything in your house you start a lemonade stand you take money out of grandma's purse you put all of your chips on Derek lewis what you don't want is a younger faster wrestler who he has to fight and he has to fly all the way down to Brazil to do it. Because Jay Alton Almeida is going to take Derek Lewis down. He's going to do it easy. He's going to do it early. He shoots a fast double leg takedown and he can get low on those legs. And I don't think that Derek Lewis is going to be able to scoop an uppercut in there like he did to Curtis Blades. I still think that Curtis Blades is the best wrestler in the division, but I also respect that Jay Alton Almeida has faster entries. And I think that's what's going to give Derek Lewis a lot of trouble. Because once he gets him down to the mat, it's over. And it's almost a shame that this is the main event because it's scheduled for five rounds. There are other fights on this card that should be five rounds, one of which looks like it's canceled, which is pain so much pain. But this fight doesn't go beyond one round regardless of who wins. Now if you're on the Jailton Almeida side, you're worried about the big knockout power from Derek Lewis. It's always there, but I don't see it materializing this week because Almeida's not going to give him the opportunities to let his hands go. I see Jailton Almeida taking him down, submitting him in round one. I don't know what the line is for that yet, but that's surely going to be one of the bets on KunithMMA.com. That's a free one for you. Jailton Almeida by submission. Keep the change, you filthy animal. In the co-main event spot, we have Gabriel Bonfim. He's fighting Nicholas Dalby and Gabriel Bonfim is one of those undefeated welterweight prospects that the UFC is starting to stockpile and he is a beast. The man can do serious damage at range because he's throwing everything with 100% power but he does his best work on the mat. The jiu-jitsu is elite, one of the nastiest guillotines in the game. Evidence of that is when he almost ripped Trevin Giles' head off last time out. That style should turn into a lot of wins for him. I know that there are a lot of good welterweight grapplers in the UFC but at the same time this is a whole nother bowl of acai. This is different gravy. On the other side, you have Nicholas Dalby, who to me is a very underrated veteran. Good cardio. He's fought 10 times in the UFC already, so the experience is rich. He's never been finished in his career. He makes a lot of good choices in the octagon as well. You've seen a lot of fight winning decisions out of him in the last couple of years. Now, there is a lot going against him this week. He's 12 years older, not nearly as explosive, nor as well-rounded as Gabriel Bonfim, and he's going to be the smaller man come Saturday. On top of that, he's a decision machine, and he hasn't really shown the ability to put anybody down with strikes, and he has hasn't really shown the ability to submit anybody in the UFC. Now he's winning fights and he has a decent record, but he's doing a lot of managing of these fights. And I think that's where he could have success this week. The Bonfim brothers fight with a lot of passion. So they start hot. And I do think that if Nicholas Dalby can find himself hanging around for a while, he could give this guy problems if it trickles into the late second, early third round. Dalby has a way of hanging around in these fights and he could end up being the fresher man later in this fight. Gabriel Bonfim has ran through everybody, but I don't see it getting to that point. I actually see Gabriel Gabriel Bonfim being able to do what he does, looking dominant as usual, and getting Nicholas Dalby to the ground, finishing this fight by submission. Historically, Bonfim's been getting it done in the first or second round, and I expect that to be the case this week. I think he wins by rear naked choke sometime in that range. Give me Gabriel Bonfim to win this fight by submission. Next, we have a fight between Rodrigo Nascimento and Don Mays. Second meeting between these two. They fought in 2020. Rodrigo Nascimento won by submission early in the second round. Now, in that fight, he got takedowns with ease and it was competitive while it was on the feet but on the ground it was not. Now Dante Mays is coming off the biggest win of his career where he knocked out Andre Arlovsky and I love that for him in this fight but not for the reasons that you might think. Considering that he's coming off of a win over a legend in the way that he did it the price is not where it should be. Frankly I see Rodrigo Nascimento being around a minus 350 favorite and he hasn't even broken minus 200 yet. The line is off people. I repeat the line is off. I don't see how Dante Mays keeps this fight standing and if you go back and you watch 
watch some of these fights. Don't just look at the result. The dude is making so many mistakes. It's like a third grader social studies essay with the amount of mistakes that you see in these Dante Maze fights. And really, I think that's going to be his undoing because I think he's going to do something that leads to him being on the ground outside of just being taken down. And once this fight is on the mat, I don't see Dante Maze really doing a whole lot to get back into the fight. He's one of these heavyweights that he may get up once or twice, but once that back goes flat, like you see a lot at heavyweight, it is Jover. And much like the first two fights that we've broken down so far, I think this one goes to the Brazilian. I think it's a submission and I think it's early. If Augusto Sakai was able to take down Maze. Well, I like the way he said it. Maze. I could see Nascimento doing it again. So the pick for me in this fight is Rodrigo Nascimento by submission. Now stop real quick. If you haven't already, like the video, subscribe to the channel, comment something for the algorithm. You know how the algorithm works. Now in this next fight, we have Kyle Bahalio fighting Abus Magomedov. And let me tell you something. Every now and again, a fighter comes around who makes a splash in the UFC. And sometimes I just don't believe it. Sometimes I'll play the wait and see game. See what this person can do and that's what I felt about Kyle Bahalio and after his first few fights I thought well this guy's just one dimensional. I didn't think that Bahalio was going to string together a whole lot of wins in the UFC. I was dead wrong and I could admit that. The man is the truth. He's 4-0 in the UFC. He put together four dominant performances back to back to back to back to back. Was that enough backs? And he really showed in his last fight that he could do it all because he was putting a beating on Lord Mihal Alexachuk. He was winning that fight and winning the brawling exchanges in that fight and that's not something that a lot of people can do against Lord Mihal. But he was doing it, and he was doing it well, and he finished him in the second round, and I can't deny the man anymore, he's great. Now on the other side, you have Abu Smagomedov, who looked like he got hit by a bus last time out against Sean Strickland. Granted, he found himself in a main event five rounds against Sean Strickland, who's currently the champion of the world. And he found himself in that position in only a second fight in the UFC. Now you can say what you want about that matchup, it wasn't a good matchup. But regardless of how bad the matchup was, and he was having success early, the man gassed out in four minutes. That's just unacceptable. Headlining a UFC event and having four minutes of gas is like booking out a theater for an hour-long comedy special and you came prepared with three jokes. I cannot trust somebody like that moving forward, especially in a matchup against a hot prospect like Kyle Bahalio, who's going to make you work. And he's going to do that with either his forward pressure on the feet or that relentless grappling and top control that he showcased on the mat. Either way, I don't see Abu Smagomedov being able to hang around for 15 minutes. I see a fifth straight dominant performance, a fifth straight win for Kyle Bahalio this week, and I expect him to win inside the distance. And real quick, if you want access to KunithMMA.com and all of the features like the lineup optimizer, the projections, the DFS strategy guide, the official bets for the week, access to the community, you can get all of that on KunithMMA.com. That'll be linked in the description and in a pinned comment. Now in this next fight, we have Hadolfo Vieira and Armin Petrosian, striker versus grappler matchup, water and oil, classic. Now one side, you have Armin Petrosian, very technical. He keeps things very tight, great footwork, hard kicks to each level. He's put together a nice run in the UFC, a 3-1 and record with this striking style, and prior to coming into the UFC, he was a knockout machine, knocking guys out, but now he's winning fights with volume and just the optics of the way that the fights are looking versus his power. And on the other side, we have one of the best grapplers in the UFC in Hadolfo Vieira, who has four wins in the promotion, all by way of submission. His striking is below average at best when you look at the middleweight division, and that's going to keep him from beating the elite ranked talent, but he's still able to beat those guys who he can get to the ground, and I see him doing that here. We talked about Kyle Bahalio potentially being one-dimensional, but that's not the case. Armin Petrosian is truly one-dimensional, and I don't care that he took down Chris Leroy Duncan last time out. The man's a fraud. Outside of that fight, Armin Petrosian has been taken down several times in each one of his UFC fights, and he's rocking a 36% takedown defense. It's not going to cut it, man. Not when you're fighting somebody like Adolfo Vieira, where the consequences are so dire when he gets you to the mat, and I don't see Petrosian and being able to stop him from doing that. And I wouldn't be surprised if we see a standing rear naked choke finish because one thing that Armin Petrosian does is he gets to a knee quickly, gets back up to his feet. The guy's always going to work back up to his feet. That's what you like to see, but that's also going to leave openings for somebody like Vieira to grab something. So I see a situation where Petrosian gets to a knee, starts to stand back up up against the cage, Vieira gets his hooks in and just wraps his head up. When you have a grappler that is at this level, who's been doing it for this long, he doesn't need to get under the chin. Everything below nose is chin. That kind of squeeze is going to give him opportunity 
opportunities to win this fight, even when the choke's not perfect. And you have to understand that jujitsu in Brazil is like basketball here in the United States. So I see a ton of submissions on this card. I think the fans are going to love it. And I like the slight dog money here. I don't really understand why. And I say that because Vieira has a much clearer path to victory here. Petrosian hasn't shown to have a lot of power in the UFC. We know that Adolfo Vieira's got a good chin. So I expect Adolfo Vieira to get this fight where he needs to, get a submission, win this fight the way he's won all of his other fights in the UFC. Give me Adolfo Vieira this week by submission. Next, we have a fight with Ishmael Bonfim and Vince from Hell Pachelle. We've seen this a lot when the UFC goes international where fights are made for the local guy to look good. Ishmael Bonfim is being put in a position to look good here. And you see that when they travel outside of the US. We saw that in Abu Dhabi where fighters were allowed to cheat with impunity. Illegal fight ending sequences were deemed unintentional and a draw was not called a draw even though it should have been. And now we're in Brazil and we have a 27 year old Ishmael Bonfim fighting a 40 year old American Vince Pichel. And let me be clear, I understand that Vince Pichel is a badass dude, but I have to acknowledge the fact that he's old. He's coming off of injury. He hasn't fought in over a year and a half. He hasn't won in over two years. And on top of that, he's been taken down 18 times in his last five fights and he's going down to Brazil with a 23% takedown defense, poor takedown defense, and not being able to work back up to his feet or what lost him his fight last time out against Marco Madsen. And that's tough when you consider that Ishmael Bonfim is looking to wrestle in this fight. He needs this win in a bad way after his last fight because Benoit Saint Denis ran through him. I also like that he's going to be able to stand and bang with Pichel when he needs to. And while I hate this part of the game, I understand that scoring is going to go to the local guy when fights are close. It can't be ignored at this point. The young Brazilian versus the old American, who's going to get the nod in the close rounds? It seems pretty obvious to me. But outside of that, I do think that Ishmael Bonfim has more ways to win this fight, I think he'll be able to dictate where the fight takes place, and for that reason, he's going to win close rounds as well. So give me Ishmael Bonfim to win this fight by decision. Now in this next fight, we have Elizu Zaleski Dos Santos fighting Renat Fakradinov. Renat Fakradinov is terrifying, and he's one of these welterweights who just looks great. Welterweight, low-key, the most talent-rich division in the UFC. And this is an interesting test for Fakradinov because Zaleski Dos Santos is a tough fight for anybody. The striking is elite, he could do a lot of damage in a short amount of time, that cap aware background leads to a lot of solid footwork but my issue with that is for as well as he moves the takedown defense isn't great and just like a tip friend to friend if you're not a fan of grappling if you see ufc fights you see grappling you're like oh my god i'm gonna go to the fridge don't even watch this card because that's what these fights are going to be from start to finish it's going to be a lot of time spent on the mat this week so strap in but we're calling Dos Santos' takedown defense into question, and when you look at Renat Fakradinov in his last couple of fights, he took down Brian Battle seven times, took down Andre Mihailidis five times, and he blasted Kevin Lee last time out, dropped him and choked him out. He hasn't shown any holes in his game yet. He can clearly compete with anybody in the division. Now, if this fight is fought at range, I can see Zaleski having the slight edge. However, I don't expect this fight to be fought at range. I see takedowns, top pressure, making him work for 15 minutes. I see Renat Fakradinov turning in another dominant dominant performance this week, moving to 4-0 in the UFC and winning this fight by decision. Next, we have a fight with Vitor Petrino and Modestas Bukowskis. I am a Modestas Bukowskis fan. I'm, I'm probably one of the three members of the Modestas Bukowskis fan club, but, but I'm one of them and I'm proud. The reason why I love the guy so much is because he had a tough run in the UFC, fought his way back, and he's gone 2-0 since. And even late into these fights, like he's looking good. He's staying behind his jab. He's keeping his feet moving and he's winning fights. He's winning minutes. He doesn't do anything too flashy. He doesn't get outside of him himself. He knows what he does well and he sticks to it. And you got to respect that very blue collar approach that you're getting from my guy Modestus Bukowskis. You won't see him looking for takedowns of his own. If he is taken down, he's not looking for submissions. He's looking to get right back up to his feet. And that's very simple, very straightforward. And for those reasons, you know when he's going to have success. We knew that that would work well against Zach Palga. We knew that he was going to expose Tyson Pedro with that same style. He did that. But this doesn't appear to be one of those spots. Vitor Petrino is a powerhouse. He's going to be throwing everything into these punches, everything into these kicks. He's going to get takedowns whenever he wants them. Bukowskis is the steadier of the two, and if he could sit down on some of these strikes and maybe get some respect on the feet, I could see him having success, but I don't think that's the case. I think that Petrino walks him down and finishes his fight. And you got to like that he's coming off of an arm triangle win late in the third round. That shows that character development. That shows that he's not just this powerhouse guy who's going to get tired early. So I actually like the gas tank. I like the size. I like the strength. I like the skill set from Vitor Petrino. I expect him to win this fight inside the distance. 
distance. Now this next fight is interesting because you have Daniel Marcos fighting Victor Hugo. The line is very wide here. And it's wide because this fight is a short notice fight. It's a debut on short notice for Victor Hugo. He's stepping in for Daniel Santos. But Daniel Marcos is still here, undefeated, very well rounded, good in tight. And in the UFC, he made his debut against Simon Oliveira, who not really UFC caliber, let's be real. Last time out, he gets a decision win over Davy Grant. Now, if you watch that fight, you know he didn't win. Truly a dog's dinner of a decision against Davy Grant last time out. Really tough. Now, Davy Grant is tough. Marcos didn't do much in that fight. Maybe it's because Davy Grant is so tough. And that's what makes it tough to go with the favorite here because I think that Victor Hugo is cut from that same cloth. The guy's going to let it all hang out. He's going to push Daniel Marcos. This fight will be competitive. A lot closer than the line is suggesting. I expect Hugo to threaten more submissions than Marcos. I expect him to throw more strikes overall and the short notice is definitely a concern for Hugo but it is for Marcos as well. He's got a new opponent, less time to prepare, a lot of uncertainty and that could serve the debutante well in this fight. I'm going to take the dog shot here on Victor Hugo. He's going to keep the fight close, possibly some home cooking when it comes to the decision. And again, the line's a little bit too wide for me, so give me Victor Hugo to win this fight by decision. Now, this is going to be the one that upsets people. This is going to be me picking Kamaru Usman to beat Hamza Chemaev, even though he won two rounds to one, let's be real. Angela Hill versus Denise Gomes. Now, when you look at fights, typically there are a couple of factors that stand out. Big gaps in age are one of them. There's a 15 year age gap between these two fighters, which is insane, but it's not as crazy as some of the age gaps that we typically see. Angela Hill, for what it's worth, is in fantastic shape, and she's a rare example of a fighter who, to me, has no prime. I think of somebody like Glover Teixeira the same way, who you can almost argue was better in his 40s than he was in his 30s. Daniel Cormier is another great example of this. I don't think that Angela Hill's younger self is much better or much worse than her older self. So I don't worry about the age gap here for Angela Hill. What I do worry about for Angela Hill is the dynamite that D Gomes is going to be throwing her way because she's putting women out. She's throwing hammers and she's riding a two fight winning streak. Angela Hill with that tie style is going to stand right in front of her. She'll be there to be hit. But with that being said, you have to look back and think about how many times you've seen Angela Hill get rocked, knocked out in her career. Zero. So what happens if Gomes can't knock her out? Well, then Angela Hill is going to take her down, going to beat her up, and she's going to pull away the later that this fight goes based on her volume. I actually think that Denise Gomes is very knockout or bust here because she's at a grappling disadvantage, a cardio disadvantage, an experience disadvantage, and could fall behind on the numbers as this fight goes on. Now, if you've been watching the UFC for a while, you have watched Angela Hill fight time and time and time again. You've seen Angela Hill lose decisions time and time and time again in fights that she looked like she was winning. I don't know if it's because she doesn't land with a whole lot of power. I don't know what it is, but the judges do not typically give Angela Hill the rub in these close fights. Take this with a grain of salt because I do think that if Angela Hill goes out there, fights 15 minutes, and it's close at all, she's not going to win, even if she does, if that makes sense. So I do think that this probably isn't going to be the most popular pick in the world, but I think that Angela Hill has more tools to win, is the better overall fighter, more well-rounded. I think that's knockout or bust for D Gomes, and I'm not going to rely on that. I think that old lady Angela gives her a, gives her a, not a fraud check, but you know, a little veteran check, if you will. I still like Denise Gomes, but I think that Angela Hill wins this fight by decision. Now for this next fight, we have Eduarda Mora. She's fighting Montserrat Conejo Ruiz. Mora's making her UFC debut undefeated. She hasn't fought the best competition, but she's winning these fights. Now, truth be told, I have not seen her fight outside of her fight on Contender Series. So I'm going into this one as blind as you are for the most part. So when we pick this fight, it's not really based off of what we know about Mora. It's more based off what we know about Conejo, and she has not gotten it done in the UFC. She's gotten destroyed in her last two UFC fights. She's giving up a lot of size in this matchup. She is a massive underdog. The only time we've seen her have success in the octagon was against Cheyenne Bays back in the day when she threw a head and arm throw and just held her in a scarf hold for the whole fight. And some would argue that she almost lost that fight just because she wasn't really doing anything when they were on the mat. So I don't think that Conejo has shown you enough to let you think that she's going to win UFC fights consistently. Her two most recent losses are very bad. She's coming in not too far removed from her last loss. And I think this is a promotional setup spot for the new undefeated prospect in the division. So give me Eduardo Mora to finish this fight. Give me Eduardo Mora inside the distance. I don't know too much. She's a big favorite. I would stay away. But at the same time, 
we know what monster are we used to bring it to the table come on next we're looking at a fight with mark dia casey fighting a ufc debutant in Cowboy fernandez this week tough debut against mark dia casey who is a well-rounded ufc veteran but fernandez looks like he has all the skills to get it done he brings a wild style with kicks heavy hooks just balls to the wall approach and mark dia casey might wilt under that pressure dia casey is seven and seven in the ufc not very consistent with his performances and if he can't get his wrestling going at this point in his career i don't have a whole lot of faith in him now it's going to sound like i'm going to really be laying it on mark dia casey here but this is just what i see he's got some of the least impressive wins in the ufc against some of the worst fighters the division has ever produced demir hadzovic is one of the worst fighters i've ever seen in the ufc vyacheslav borshov is one of the better kickboxers in the division but cannot defend a takedown to save his life lando venata has been the most up and down guy in the division's history maybe ever you've got joe duffy joe duffy's honestly a solid win and then he's got the losses to guys like hack perast and hooker and close who are all solid but then we start looking at some of these earlier wins it's just the level of competition is not crazy he's losing fights against uh, the step up in competition and he's beating guys who probably don't belong in the division when he takes a step up he falls short and you've got fernandez who's fighting out of a good gym he's fighting in front of his people he brings the heat early mark dia casey is going to give this guy the time and space that he needs to let his strikes go he did that against michael johnson he lost the fight because of it giving somebody like fernandez the green light to let his hands go let his kicks go and just g do what he does let letting him be him is a recipe for disaster so i'm going with the newcomer i'm going with fernandez who's going to go 100 miles per hour from start to finish give me Callier fernandez inside the distance and if you've made it to this point in the video thank you so much for watching i really do appreciate it make sure you like the video subscribe to the channel comment something for the algorithm and i'll see you later in the week for final picks